What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video. In this one, I'm going to be building the best gaming PC you can assemble right now for under $2,000. Perfect for gaming at 4K and 1440p in all of the latest titles with some great value but very high performing hardware. I'll be running you guys through all the parts that make this build possible, how to assemble it step by step and looking at performance in detail later. So let's jump right into it. The Cooler Master Tempest GP27U gaming monitor is a stunning quantum dot mini LED monitor that boasts a huge 576 local dimming zones. The crisp high resolution 4K panel provides stacks of detail and is backed up by a competitive 160 hertz refresh rate. With a one millisecond response time, 27 inch form factor and HDMI 2.1 support to run the latest consoles at up to 4K 120 hertz, it really does tick a lot of boxes. You can learn more about the GP27U at the first link in the description below. I'm going to start things off by taking a look at the GPU choice in today's build and for those of you who aren't really keeping up with PC hardware pricing you might be confused to see a Radeon RX 6950 XT. James haven't Nvidia released new 40 series cards and AMD themselves brought out two new top end GPUs? Yes, but you shouldn't buy any of them. The 6950XT is a card that's been well renowned as a solid 4K performer. The kicker with the 6950XT is the mad price drops that we've seen. The cheapest 6950XT I've seen comes in for like $640, but there are loads of options for sub $700, including this MSI Gaming X Trio design. Take a look at the performance graphs. You can see that it offers up better frame rate than the 4070, 4070 Ti, even the likes of the 4080 many titles, a card which costs more than the 6950 XT. It also goes some way to alienate AMD's own customer base for the 7900 XT, a card that gives a little bit more performance, but for another two or three hundred dollars. The main kicker though with this card is the VRAM. 16 gigabytes of it makes it amazing for the next gen titles that chew up as much video memory as they can get. Now to pair up the graphics card, we of course need to go for a good CPU and motherboard combo too, and that's where the next two components come in today. Now the budget for this build accounts for an i5 13600K processor, though with the $104 that's to spare in the $2000 budget today, you could upgrade this to the i7 if you wish. Looking at the i5 though, you still get great clock speeds, overclocking support, DDR5, PCI Gen 5, the 13th gen lineup ticks a lot of boxes. And it's rumoured that Intel's 14th gen may actually use the same motherboard chipsets and same motherboard socket as 13th gen. So potentially investing in a Z790 solution might not be such a bad idea. Now this particular Z790 solution comes from MSI and is their MPG Z790 Edge. Take a look at this. Taking a quick look around the motherboard and you've got the obviously the LGA socket we need for those 13th and 12th gen processors, DDR5 memory support, PCI Gen 5 for your SSD and GPU and then on the rear panel a really solid I.O. Obviously you've got all your fast USB-C ports, USB type A, two and a half gig ethernet and Wi-Fi 6E. Great for getting connected and getting the latest in networking speeds. CPU installation is a pretty easy affair really on 13th gen. Simply drop the chip into the motherboard, the golden triangle to the bottom left hand corner just here on the socket, pop the cover down and return the arm back into place. Now can be a little bit fiddly, get it lined up, then pop the arm in and it's nice and simple. I'm also going to pop in our memory at this stage, a 32 gigabyte kit of Corsair, Corsair? Definitely not Corsair, Kingston Fury Renegade. I think we use so many Corsair RAM kits, my vocabulary just immediately went there. This is a really nice RAM kit though, it's got a speed of 6,000 mega transfers per second, decent cast latencies and it's got a colour scheme that should fit with the overall build aesthetic I'm going for. Mainly white and silver, but also with hints of black in there as well. Ram dim wise, you want to pull back the clips on the second and fourth dims. So the one closest to the motherboard, 24 pin cable, and then the second one in from the CPU. Slide the ram in, bit of pressure to each side, and the ram will click in nice and easily. Repeat this for as many dims as you've got. And of course, if you add more dims later, you can just populate those empty slots. A little bit stiff, but it's all in and it's nice and steady. I'm also going to add the M.2 SSD in at this stage. Now you'll see here, we've actually got a tallest M.2 heatsink. So I can push this cover in, pull it out, nice and easy, no screwdriver required. Dropping in my one terabyte Lexar NM790, which is the NVMe drive choice of this build. Super, super good value and decent gem full speeds at that too. Push the cover over and then add back into place the MSI tallest heatsink. Down 
a little bit fiddly, but once you get the hang of it, it's nice and easy. Push it down and it makes a satisfying click sound. Now, with that, the motherboard assembly is basically complete, but there are one or two more things I'd like to do at this stage before looking at the case. The first of those is some prep for the CPU cooler. In particular, I've got this, the Cooler Master Master Liquid 240L in white. That's right, this build is, as I say, gonna go for a little bit of a white color scheme, and this nice refreshed Cooler Master cooler design is no exception. Despite the fact that this is a undoubtedly high-end 4K gaming PC build, I still didn't want to spend a fortune, and this cooler is the perfect example of that. There's no point in saving loads of money on the GPU and getting this great value 6950 XT, and then blowing all the savings on a ridiculously expensive AIO that, let's be honest, isn't going to provide much more by way of performance than something like this. It's also available in a 360mm version, which you may want to consider for a little bit more cooling capacity, especially if you step this build up to the more pricey i7-13700K. Now, you can see here we've got the radiator water block, all looks very nice, but the thing I'm looking for is this bag of included mounting hardware, and this is what I need to take a look at for the next stage of the build. Inside the cooler mounting box, you'll find these two bits of hardware. So pick up the motherboard like so, and on the rear, locate these four holes just here. The back plate is gonna sit in each of these holes, a little something like this, nice and easy, and give us a thread hole on each corner, one, one, two, three, four. Then we're gonna take the posts I just referred to a moment ago and screw these posts into these thread holes. Pretty simple so far. Just get these finger tight. You haven't necessarily got to tighten these up with a screwdriver or anything like that. And just make sure we've got one nice and evenly on each corner. Once that's all done, the motherboard is ready to go and I can take a look at the next component. Bear with me, it's just over here on the floor. And that is the case. Now this is the Masterbox TD500 Mesh V2. Now I was, a massive fan of the original TD500 mesh. I think I bought like four of them over two years, did so many builds. One of our most popular builds ever is in the TD500 mesh, and this version is a bit more beefy, shall we say. This chassis retains the cool kind of angular, kind of engraved or molded side panel, which I really like, the glass tempered panel, alongside three ARGB fans up front, and you get a bit more headroom in this case, allowing for larger top radiator cooling solutions. And it's also, I believe, slightly longer, so you've got more scope for next-gen GPU releases, stuff like a 4070, 4080, or in our case, this, the 6950 XT. Now, what I'm gonna do is just also remove the rear panel. I'd always recommend that in any chassis, any build, regardless of how much you spend, take off all the panels, and then we're good to actually pop the motherboard in. Now, I am gonna lay, stay there, lay the case down flat for this stage, as it does make things that little bit easier. And then the motherboard will very easily slide into place, built-in rear I.O. shields, kind of normal nowadays, so nothing to worry about there either. And then all I need to do is just screw the motherboard in through all the nine standoffs. There's three at the top, three along the middle, and three down the bottom. I find it sort of oddly therapeutic screwing in motherboard standoffs, you know? It's just a nice relaxing task and it makes you feel, at the end, quite accomplished when they're all in place. All that's then left to do is remove this rear dust filter to give access for the radiator installation. So if we take a look here, I've already added the fans on, got that ready in advance, and the radiator is just gonna sit at the top of the case. Now we can, of course, move this on the rails that Cooler Master have included, and it will also go ahead and provide a good amount of exhaust airflow for the build, helping to keep pressure in a good place. You get the screws that you need to install this included, and I think I'm just going to put it over towards the rear of the case, just for aesthetic purposes. Finishing off the cooler is pretty easy. Grab a tube of thermal paste and add a drop of the thermal good stuff onto your CPU. Not too much. It doesn't matter if it's a bit messy. That does look a bit messy, but it's okay. And then add into place the water block, a little something like so. There we are. So that's going to sit onto those posts, and four of the included thumb screws are going to fasten this down. Of course, ensure we've got good contact with the processor for good cooling and also stop the water block from going anywhere. I'll be wiring up all the cables a little bit later. The GPU is then the next part on the list and we can take a look at this MSI 6950XT Gaming X Trio. Now, we were talking about this in our Geekor offices and we were saying that it's actually kind of interesting how these old cards are now suddenly not just back in favour, but like the best options by a mile. I don't think we've ever really seen this before whereby the new graphics cards become bad value. It tends to be that the older GPUs are a decent shout if you want a bit more performance and you want to explore, say, the second-hand market, but these are available brand new for prices we just aren't seeing on next-gen options from both AMD and NVIDIA. It's like AMD have killed off their own new cards, at least for now. So grab one of these while they're still cheap and you can get all that straight rasterization performance that we like to see. In terms of finding out where in the case this is going to fit, I am going to hover the graphics card over the top PCI slot just here, and that shows me that I need to remove 
covers the second and third covers. That's this one and this one just here. What's also quite nice about the last gen cards in this 6950 XT is that they're a bit smaller. They're actually very, very compatible with a wide range of components, making the purchase case for the 6950 XT seemingly stronger by the day. Push the clip back on the retention slot. There we go. Slide the GPU in, lovely stuff. Bit of pressure makes a nice click and it's looking good. The little silver accents help to tie it in with the rest of the build. Ideally, a white card would have been better, but beggars cannot be choosers, especially when we're getting such a bargain with the 6950 XT. Couple of screws, and of course it does need power, but I'll be dealing with that a little bit later. Talking of power supplies, for this build I've picked out a couple of options. Now, technically, the V750i Gold from Cooler Master will be fine. The build's gonna consume about 600 watts, give or take, under load, and this is a very efficient 80 plus gold unit. However, Cooler Master also kindly sent out this, their XG Plus 850 Platinum, which I've been keen to check out. It's got a screen and an extra 100 watts. Probably a good idea for a build with a GPU that consumes this much power. That isn't to say though, there aren't middle grounds. You could go for a cheaper 850 watt power supply from Cooler Master or other brands out there. And I'll leave lots of options below that perhaps don't cost as much as this, but provide a little bit more wattage than this. Still a really nice power supply though, and I'm keen to check it out. You will be able to see the screen too, because this cover on the TD500 Mesh V2 is removable. It's almost like they designed it for this exact purpose. This video isn't going to be a full cables and wiring guide, but I do want to have a little bit of a look around the power supply. Pretty standardized form factor, fully modular interface for all your different cables, RGB fan, and here it is, the screen. You also get a nice bag of included cables for all the bits and bobs that we need in this build. It is a fully digital unit, and what that means is we can monitor the wattage by this little USB header on the screen, but also in Cooler Master's Master Plus, I believe it's called, their proprietary software suite as well. So plenty of options there. Pop in all the modular cables, and then I'm gonna add in some custom sleeved cable extensions to finish the whole build off. Links to these also will be down at the affiliate links in the description below. And with that, the build is ready to go. All that's left to do now is boot it up to check out performance, but first, Let's see how good it looks with the RGB on, the fans spinning, and the whole build powered up. And I'll rejoin you in just a second. system looking good, it's now time to make sure the performance stacks up in an equally as promising manner. And to do that, I tested out a wide variety of games on this build from the likes of Hogwarts Legacy and F1 2022 to esports titles like Warzone 2 and Fortnite for good measure. Starting off with Hogwarts Legacy and pushing things to the max at 4K high settings, the build pulled in a respectable 66 frames per second on average. 90 and 99th percentile results are also strong and as ever, all the testing was done with MSI Afterburner's Reaver Tuner and and NVIDIA frame view. Move over to Star Wars Jedi Survivor at 4K high settings once again and the frame rate fairly similar, 85 FPS on average, providing a very smooth gaming experience at this top end resolution. Of course, drop to 1440p and you'll be able to easily pull in more than 100 FPS. Warzone 2 at 4K high was also a similarly positive story, 95 FPS on average with stable 90 and 99th percentiles too. But what about if we drop down to 1080p competitive in the next title, Fortnite? Here the build managed to pull in an astonishing 322 frames per second on average, making for a fantastic, highly competitive gaming experience. Apex Legends also performed well 4K high in this title, and the build delivered 170 FPS on average, meaning that more than 200 would easily be attainable at 1440p. This is a build then that provides top tier 1440p and 4K performance for a $2,000 budget, and you can learn more about all the parts mentioned today at the first links down below. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next next one.